So well, let me just start right from the right, right straight away into our vision statement. So this has been out for about uh, two to three years now since we moved here, and God took us for a stage of restoration. And and so there is a you have a copy on your chairs or every second chair or something on there. And I want to just read this to you. I'm not going to stay there because then I'm going to move into what I felt God is wanting to say specifically, not just to the church, but to you personally this year. So uh, our, our vision our vision is to be a church that is significant, impacting, radical, loving, and unrelenting in its pursuit of God's presence, purpose, and power. An influential, diverse group of people in multiple locations creating opportunities to encounter God. When we got that, there was a very, um, there was not a very diverse group here at the moment. It was pretty white, and now look around, and we're pretty diverse, all ages, from the some quarter of our quarter of our congregation, at least a quarter, maybe a third, is under twelve. That's pretty diverse. So, um, um, very diverse. So, uh, we're very excited what God is doing here. Our mission is to reach out and equip committed followers of Jesus Christ, who are victorious and productive members of their communities around the world. They're not survivors, they're not victims, they're victorious, productive members, not only of this church, but of the world, making a difference for Jesus. That's our mission. And so some of the things we do in the church is to raise that up and, uh, and uh, as we go along the journey. So there's also our values, which if you come to Growth Track this afternoon, we'll talk more about as well. But the big picture, it's a big picture for a church here in the suburbs. And uh, we need to remember that God, is, however, we need to remember that God established this church. And gave it a vision, a mission that hasn't changed. You know, actually, when it was first planted, I found out the other day, September 1973, the little building up in the corner was there. I was a child that would come and do working bees out of Hyde Street. My dad would work on it. Uh, Pastor Bill came about two years later, I think it was, and uh, into Hyde Street. And there'd be others here that would have been, maybe no one else was here in 1997, 1973. Anyone else? And okay. And so it was, um, I was a child. Let me just remind you, a very small child. And but God planted it with its own, with a vision and a mission that He wanted in this place, and it hasn't changed. It might be reworded, but the, it doesn't change. You go to any church in the world, this is basically what God's called us to do: go in the world and make disciples. And uh, so, uh, but so yes, yeah, so it hasn't changed. It's man that messes it up, that diverts it. It's not God. So really, the bottom line is for man to get on back on board, believe again, and work again, work together again for the plan. So these statements, actually, as I've already mentioned or hinted at, have already been fulfilled in the last couple of years. And, and, uh, and so we want to outline some plans. There'll be more plans that will, uh, that will still be unfolding and will still take the place. And these plans have been fulfilled in spite of COVID for two years, lockdowns, isolations, mandates, and all the other dates and things that you want to add in there. And, um, and so we have actually seen God bless not just us, but Christendom. And the world might not tell you this, but God is actually moving around the world. Don't have time to remind you of that, but maybe tonight we might get time um, as we unpack this again, but in a different vein. So the verse I have, and it's been with me, or the, there's one word I got, and then this verse came with it. And I want to read this to you and then unpack that. And then tonight, we really want to get into deliverance and prayer and prayer and breakthrough. Today, it's about, uh, we'll, uh, it's about vision, and this morning, and a bit tonight, where we will talk about things that will take place. But tonight, we're going to take, uh, go after some stuff that may have been holding you back. Because it's Isaiah 54, says this, verse 1 to verse 3. Sing, O barren woman, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. So, woman who has not produced, woman who is no longer expectant, enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Interesting, the song that we learned this morning, talk about revival, spreading, the last very verse that we read there. But first, let's go to the, back to the, the, the very root of this. The key word I felt for our church and for us today and for myself and for you as individuals is to expect. Expect again. Expect now, I understand maybe online and in this room today, and I say this with um, gentleness in my heart, that there may be people who are listening 
and here that you know the pain and causes of not producing or being barren. But I'm talking not so much about that, but there was a link to that because of the pain that that does produce. I'm talking about spiritual and soul things today that affect our choices and life on earth. And so please don't take offense at the way we talked this morning because uh, God wants, but still be open to hear what God is saying to you in this season for your life. I'm so aware that even as God gave me this over the last month, well, the word expect was actually last year, uh, at the end of last year. So we're so aware that in the last 10 days, we've had two babies born into the church. And even this morning, you know, we, our family is so busy. Nathan's gone and doing FIFO. So one week on, he's gone, um, got out of the military and ended up back on securing a base now. So he's away. Kuna's on stage. Uh, we're on stage and we've got kids up, the grandkids up there. And then I'm holding my youngest uh, grandchild, my Kelly, in my arms. And I'm so aware of this powerful force called expectation for next generations. I actually smell a little bit like wee, I think, because his nappy was pretty wet. So if you want to hug me and get a good dose of my Kelly P, then you can do that right there. Okay. But I'm just aware of the whole atmosphere of expectation. And that's what this woman is told to do again. I want you to expect, barren woman, you've forgotten, you've given up, you've stopped trying. Now is the time to rise up and expect again. See, in Genesis, God commanded Adam and Eve. What was the first thing he told Adam and Eve? Be fruitful, multiply, and rule. And guess what? This is not man's mandate. This is God's mandate. I don't care what anybody else says, God says to mankind, and He's still saying it to the redeemed, this, I want you to go back to the original place, no matter where you started, how you started, what you've become, because I've said I'll create, make you into a new creation and go back and still be fruitful, multiply and rule. No matter the failures, the past, the disappointment, spouses, and even the wrong spouses, and or even abortion that may have occurred in our soulish, in our lives, he says, I want you to get back and live with expectation because all of those things will start to rob you if we don't. God is speaking to those who have no vision, who have no dreams, no expectations, no creativity. There's no passion. There's no motivation. There's, uh, th there's even a feel of captivity and dryness. And he says again, because that's who this woman was. If you follow her, her name was Zion and she was Israel and she had been in captivity. And God is saying, I want you to rise up. I want you to rise up. Be pregnant. Be expecting. Be pregnant and be expecting. And so right now, as I just as we go into this, I just want to pray. Father, I just pray over this place that you will impart something supernatural into our soul, that you will reveal your amazing forgiveness and mercy right now and all that are here, that you will heal past, you will restore hope, you will make pregnant again, and you will, uh, uh, you will reveal destinies. Lord, that the vision that you're given for this year, that, Lord, it will actually be a life vision for each and every one of us to expect and believe again. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. See, expectation is critical. You can't have a birth without it. Even Mary, a divine uh, a birth, virgin birth, still had nine months of expectation. She carried. You can't have a birth without it. So we wonder why my life doesn't produce anything. It's because we actually take one step back. It's because we actually haven't been expecting it to do anything. What we expect is what we give birth to. So you expect nothing, guess what? We give birth to nothing. So it's critical that we understand the power of expectation. Some live cursed lives because they actually expect of it. So that's my destiny. Whatever I grew up in, whatever happened to me, that's, what I, that's my stuff. That's what I got to carry. And so you know what? Even after they're born again, they still think that is who I am and what I was. So they still keep producing cursed lives because that's what they expect. And they give birth to it. Some live with favor. Because guess what? They live with expectation of favor. Expectation is the start. Why is all that? Because it's the starting point of faith. Faith is what is needed to be saved. With scriptures, we haven't got time to go through them all. We receive salvation through faith. We please God through faith. Miracles happen through faith. All of these things and more happen through faith. And Hebrews 11 one describes faith as this. Faith is the substance or realization 
of things hoped for. So to have faith, there must be hope in you. It's the evidence or confidence of things not yet seen. And I'm not going to unpack faith today. You can go and do that at your own leisure. But what I'm talking about is this word, there is a substance or realization of things hoped for. That is the evidence, something is inside of me that says yes and amen, that this is what I hope for, this hope. And now this word hope is not what we would describe as, maybe it might happen, you know. I live one day that my wife might tell me that I'm awesome or I'm good looking or something like that without paying her or something like that. You know, I live with some kind of, you know, I don't know, nebulous feeling that it may happen. Now, the word in the Greek, it actually means confident expectation. It's not a nebulous feeling. I actually live with this confident expectation. Faith is living with this thing inside of me that says it is going to happen. So you can't have faith without hope and you can't have hope without expectation confident expectation. There's been a real collapse in the Christian church of expectation. You know, I shared in the prayer meeting, I was looking up the U version. I love reading out of the U version. I do plans in there and I read my Bible from there. And I was looking for, um, I was looking for plans on physical healing. All the plans of bar one or two were all about emotional healing, relationship healing, and all other kinds of healing, which are all important. But I could only find two that would talk about the power of God to heal you physically. Now, there might be more, but that's what I found quickly. And what I'm saying is almost like the expectation that God can heal you physically has gone. He can do something good if you go and do certain courses in your mind and your health. But what about physically? And so expectation for the supernatural power of God to flow into people's lives has diminished because of failures and disappointments. And guess what? We give birth to nothing when we expect nothing. That's just one area. You know your own areas that God is saying to rise up again. And so we see in recent times an eroding of Christian values. And lately with the helplessness and hopelessness, we feel in a COVID-ruled world that a lack of expectation and we may be existing or surviving, but not expecting. And God is challenging us to expect, not to exist or survive. That's not the church. That is not our mission. That we, we are to be productive, to be fruitful, to multiply, and to rule. God never called the church. It doesn't have to be rich and big, but He still called the church to be fruitful, multiply, and rule. Is everybody awake out there? Someone's like, I'm... Scare you. Masks are a dangerous thing to interpret. Have you noticed that? Trying to interpret people behind a mask. Everybody glares at you from behind a mask. Some people, only a few people can smile with their eyes, I've noticed. Yeah, yes. <laughs> you try smiling just with your eyes. You look weird now. Okay. <laughs> but God is challenging us. So I, here's a simple question. What are you expecting in 2022? I sense, not, I'm not talking about the church, I'm talking about the world. I think a lot of people just go, same old, same old. I actually can't expect anything because Mr. McGowan's going to change the rules again or the virus is going to do this or it's going to evolve with something, a world health or, or the Chinese are going to do something or the Russians are going to attack somebody or something. I'm just not going to expect anything. That's a lie of the devil. Who says that we should live like that? The minute we live like that, we are dictating someone else's influence upon our lives now i'm not saying we uh, please don't misunderstand me that i'm going down some other path anti this and anti that i'm just saying who rules your life you take control and you start to expect maybe nothing not much or same same but how about we awaken and start to expect again a barren would not a barren woman in this case would not expect much but god says to a barren woman i actually want you to expect you who cannot produce, I actually want you to expect. How stupid can you be to tell that to a woman? How hurtful could you be to say that? But God says to her, I want you to expect again. Come on, woman. Because he's a supernatural God. He's not defied by human circumstances. He's saying, to, uh, he's saying come and have uh, expectation. Expect. Be pregnant, act like it, sing like it. Live with expectation, the joy, the hope, the eyes on the prize is what he's asking again. Reject the barren label. 
this church, we need to reject the past and labels and all kinds of things. Refugees, if you happen to be in this case, reject that label upon your life. That was who you were. That's not who you are here today. Those who have been around a little while know that I reject. I got to this church three years ago and heard the slogan KGB, uh, which was um, Kundula Gerwin Bagger. I reject that in God's name. I will not have that label over this suburb. Why would I be proud of such a domineering evil label over us? That's not God. That's small. That's diminished thinking. There's no expectation except for death and curse in that. We won't label ourselves things like that. We won't be proud of labels like that. Because what we are proud of and what we're expecting of is, guess, that's what we produce and I'll give birth to. If you're carrying that label proudly, you're going to give birth to the product of that. So let's not. It's time. So, so we reject the barren label. Jesus had to reject his labels. Do you know that when he started to look for his disciples, Philip came to him and then Philip went, I'm going to go and find another disciple for Jesus. So he went to a guy called Nathaniel. He rushes off to Nathaniel and says, let me tell you about this man. He is the coolest dude around. He says, oh, we, we're going to follow him. And he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel goes, what good can come out of Nazareth? He had a label. What good can come out of Gerwin? What good can come out of Nazareth? Jesus had the same label. And all Jesus, and I love Phil. He goes, hey, just come and find out for yourself. Stop your argument. Let me just meet you to him. And so he turns up and Jesus says, hey, man, there's no one more integrous than you in all of Israel. Nathaniel goes, wow, how do you know? Because I saw you having this conversation under such and such a tree with Philip. Gives him a word of God. Gives him a, not word, a prophecy about who he is. And he says, it's time to come back to not accepting the label, but, and, and, but to accept Jesus and his supernatural power, his word, his prophetic word, what he has said over your life and over our lives. See, what you're expecting is what you'll give birth to. The locals of Nazareth expected nothing from a local boy, Jesus. And guess what? They got nothing. Because if you read in Luke chapter 4, uh, he came to Nazareth, it says, where he had been brought up. So he came back to his hometown. This is after Jesus has just gone and uh, defied Satan. He's done his 40-day fast. He's been baptized, anointed the Holy, filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, done his 40-day fast. And the first thing he does after that is come to Nazareth, filled with the Holy Ghost. I've just spoken the devil. He's had to flee. And he goes and preaches, anointed of God. And so he goes there and he says, as was his custom. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had entered the, opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. This is Jesus talking to the Nazareth, talking to everybody in the temple. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God, He has anointed, the Spirit has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he preaches it. He imparts. He speaks hope and future and destiny and a seed of faith into these people that, of Nazareth. And they rejected him. Because he's just Joseph's son. They question him. Who do you think you are? He responds, guess what, you lot? <laughs> he doesn't pull any punches. He responds, the prophet isn't honored in his hometown. And you guys are acting just like Israel, the unfaithful Israel of old. And you know what the Bible says that they did after that? You think maybe we might listen to him now? No, it says that when they heard this, the people of the synagogue were furious, jumping up. They mobbed him and faced him to the chased him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Jesus in his hometown was rejected, but he still was expecting. Because we know after that what he ended up doing around Samaria and Jerusalem and Israel. They were barren. They had nothing. They were empty. They were the barren ones, not Jesus. He's giving birth. He's impregnating. He's speaking life. And they're the barren ones, not receiving. And then, of course, they reject Him. They have nothing to give. And so they only want to take. And that's why we have to also be very expectant and be very careful about who we hang out with because barren do not impregnate barren. So what are we expecting? Well, let me just highlight a couple of things. 
more tonight. We'll go into more of this area. But sing before you are pregnant. Don't wait till you're pregnant. Sing. Singing is saying, I'm expecting before I'm expecting. You know, they have parties in the world now. I don't know where they, oh, not in the world, but in, uh, you pregnant people, you people that have babies these days. And um, you go and have the revealing parties of the sex of the baby. Whatever happened to the surprise of giving birth? You go, wow, what is that? But now you find it all out, there's no surprise. But you have these parties to reveal them. You know, he's saying, even before you're pregnant, I want you to have a party. I don't want to wait till you can know the sex of it and reveal it then or wait till the baby is born. I want you to start parting now before you're even pregnant, before you've even seen the destiny fulfilled. I want you to be a praise people. Wow, some of you like that. The woman is, this woman, as we said, is Zion, the bride awaiting God. And she had been uh, in captivity. She'd been in isolation. She'd been in drought and she'd been in doubt. And today Zion is now the church. And so we, the church, are in the same place sometimes. She was lost, felt abandoned and useless. But God says, no matter what, sing, barren woman. And we may feel with all the attack and the, and the you know, the, the, even this week with the religious, whatever it's called, um, uh, protection bill, not getting through. You know what? I'm not overly concerned because I don't, my, my hope is not in the laws of the land. I mean, I don't know anywhere in time did the laws of the land protect the church too much. Go for the Bible. They didn't protect too much. And when they didn't protect too much, guess what? Revival happened. The laws aren't my protector. They're not my provider. If I'm a man of faith, if I live with confident expectation, guess what? My provider is God. My hope is in God. My hope is in Jesus. When Tracy shared that scripture this morning, suddenly there was a storm. Jesus at peace. And suddenly there wasn't a storm when Jesus spoke up. He's my provider. Sing, praise, worship, get spiritually intimate again. Receive, be impregnated again. And we talk more about breaking that stuff tonight. And we're going to pray with people that are, that are struggling with this barrenness. But here's the last point before we get into action. Don't embrace the condition, praise and obey the promise. That's what we do as men and women of faith. We do not embrace the condition we praise the promiser who created the promise. But you know what I've discovered watching you women have babies or my wife have babies and, and you ever give birth is that expectation requires action. They eventually have to give birth. You just don't, it doesn't just happen. Only happen to Mary and none of you are Mary. But the rest of us, especially women, Something has to take place. And then there has to be a birth. And so I want to talk about that a little bit more. I want to start with a little story about a man called William Carey. Has anyone heard of William Carey? Some of you religious people, that's really good to hear. That's because I told half of you leaders at the leaders meeting before you got to that. None of you knew before that. William Carey, the father of modern missions and the founder of the Baptist Mission Society. He was born in 1761, and at that time, the church has stopped sending missionaries around the world. At 25 years of age, at 25, okay, who's 25, 24, 25, 26 in this place today? Who wishes they would be that age right now? Okay. Okay, John, I'm just preaching to you right now. Okay. At 25 in 1786, he preaches to the Baptist Convention that we are called to go into all the world and save the lost. He is shut down, and some even told him, if God wants to save the world, he can do it without us. At 28, in 1789, he leads his own church, but he's still pregnant with missions. As a cobbler, that's what his trade was, he makes himself a big leather world globe and places all the countries and maps. He gets another list with statistics about the Christianity in each of those countries. And he fills himself, he impregnates and makes himself expectant with missions and changing the world. He's expectant and pregnant. He writes an article, the first time in English anyone has written such an article ever. And it's an article called An Inquiry into the Obligation of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathen. It's a long title. 
It detailed the biblical obligation to reach unreached people groups. It rebuffed the common excuses used and called the church to personal sacrifice to reach them. This is a 28-year-old making this statement. All the older ministers are saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Three years later, in 1792, he again gets an opportunity to stand before the ministers at a convention of pastors. And he preaches what is now called a famous sermon. It's called the Deathless Sermon from Isaiah chapter 54, verses 2 to 3. And he has two key points. And when I say them, hopefully many of you will understand them. But the first, his two key points, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And when he stood down after preaching that with expectant and pregnant with missions and changing the world, he said, and I am the first to go from this place and attempt great things for God. Send me. I can't preach it anymore. I'm going to go. You send me. I will go wherever you send me. Twelve months later, six months of, including six months of boat travel, him and his wife and kids are in India. He put his mouth where his money was. He put, sorry, he put his money where his mouth was. He put action to his expectation. A year later, he's in India with a mentally ill wife, by the way. So his spouse was no longer on board. She, in fact, wasn't going to come, but at the last minute chose to come. Uh, she, he's got dysentery. They have no money. It has dried up by the time they got. And the East India Company, which ran all of that part of the world, which quite, it was powerful, was opposing him. But he still had expectation. He got a job. He ended up working for the East India Company. And that opened some doors. He brought a printing, printing press. He was gifted with language. He discovered that I've got these gifts. So guess what? He said, this is what I'm called here to do. If I've got these gifts, that's what I'm meant to be doing. If I've been given a gift from God, then I better operate in the gift that God gave me. So he started learning languages after languages, and he started to translate the Bible. And the first translation was in the language of Bengali. Then not long after, he lost his six-year-old son. She, he died. And his wife ended up being hospital, sorry, being uh, uh, put in a bed for eight years until she died in 1807. She'd never fully recovered from other losses in her life. And so she was never on board. And as far as missions go, his wife was barren in supporting him. His Bengali Bible, however, opened doors for the gospel. His expectation gave birth through his actions. You think, yes, I'm on the road. In 1812, Everything he owns is burnt down. Printing presses, manuscripts, uh, prints, documents, materials are burned. He was barren again. Nothing. But still living with expectation. Interestingly, this event changed everything. Because it revealed to the world what he was doing alone in India. Within 50 days, they had raised uh, 10,000 pounds from Europe was raised, which would be half a million to a million dollars today. All because his stuff got burnt down. He was that was raised and sent. This enabled him to build a college and continue preaching, teaching, translating, and writing many pamphlets and the Bible. The Bible in 40 different Indian languages before he passed away. Mission in the world was changed because one man lived with expectation. Expect great things from God. Do great things for God. A lot of us live the blessed life. I want the blessed life because I want God. I expect great things for God. I expect great things for God. Ooh, 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 ooh. I expect them. Give me, give me, give me. Uh, what do I, what's the rest of that, Dad? My name's Jimmy. And... Um, that's what we want. We want. We give me, give me. I want it. I want it. I want it. But that's not the cry of God's heart. What I give you is to be poured out. A man who lived expectant and attempted great things. A man who didn't let labels, others, failures, spouse, his youthfulness, culture, or disappointment, hurts, setbacks, and more keep him barren. Do you know what's happening in our youth at the moment? I'm just so excited. There's a bunch of girls that go around the highway talking and trying, uh, and I don't know if it's happened yet, but going to get uh, uh, 
they all come together. In fact, I can't tell you the whole story, but one of those girls was meant to go to another school, but because of vaccination, blah, 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 she, her dream was actually thwarted, and she couldn't go to this school in her, her dream for what she was meant to do. And uh, she ended up at Girawain with two of her closest friends, and now they're starting to pray. I don't know if they started praying or about to start praying together. And then they told me, they came to prayer meeting. 15, 16-year-olds came to 16, yes, 15, 16-year-olds came to prayer meeting this week. And guess what? Then in the middle of the prayer meeting at the end, we're just celebrating God. They tell us, guess what? We led our first girl to Jesus this week. Yeah. Expect great things from God. Do great things for God. If you aren't expectant, reject the barrenness and the cause. Embrace the Word of God as your baby, and the power of the Holy Spirit who will impregnate you with it. Sing and start the attempt. And we'll talk more about this tonight. Feed the unborn vision. You know, we get expect. you know, we can sit in church sometimes. We can sit there and go, wow, pastor, thank you. <sighs> but then we go home and starve the, ba- the unborn baby. Have you noticed that? We go home and we turn on something, we watch something, we get into an argument, and all that I've been filled with has suddenly been killed. We've aborted the dream. So God says, feed the baby. Prepare the room. What do you do when you've got a baby coming? You, advance, you prepare the room. Let God do it again in you. No matter what age, it might change, but God still wants us to live to the day. And I've got stories I could talk about of those who lived with expectation, including Smith Wigglesworth, right up to the day they die, still performing, still believing, still seeing God doing miracles. And tonight we're going to pray into some of this barrenness and into infertility and some of this uh, death that's been holding us back in disappointment. It's going to break. I'm going to show why we have to do that. But let's look at what happened in the rest of this passage this morning. Look what Zion is told to do. So it doesn't stop and saying just be expectant. He actually says, now I want you to go and prepare the baby's room. Is that what we do? If you've got to, if you go and get buy furniture, we paint it up, and I suppose that's why you've got to know if it's pink or blue, and uh, if it's a boy or girl, so give it pink or blue, or whatever you do. But this, but here, the rest of this passage is a blueprint for your life and for the church, not just for one year, but for the church till Jesus comes back again. And so how does that work here at ECC? We will be pregnant and prepare as we prepare the room. So let's break this down. The rest of the verse says, Isaiah, Isaiah 54 verse 2, it says, the first part is, enlarge the place of your tent. So woman, Zion, I want you to be pregnant again. I want you to be singing a new song of expecting. And while you're still expecting, she's actually not pregnant, by the way. I want you to think again, be expectant again. I want you to start to dream and sing again. And while you're doing, I actually want you to do these other things. I want you to start to enlarge the place of your tent. Now, this is not enlarge the tent. This is the place of your tent. This is the geography, the location, the land, the area of influence. I want you to enlarge where the tent, I want you to go out and around the tent. I want to make sure you've got that covered. I want to make sure that you're thinking beyond just one more child. You're thinking generationally. You're thinking bigger. You're thinking generation, 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 and generation. I want you, barren woman, to be thinking beyond even one child. I want to say, as a church, ECC is bigger than just Girawin. It's meant to reach further away than just one suburb. This doesn't mean we get up and we ship location. But we have to look further afield. We have, you know what else we have to do? What does that happen to you women will tell you? When you're newly married, what do you do when you want to have kids? You start talking about it. Don't you? Oh, I can't wait to have kids. Or when are we going to have kids? How many we do? do we want? Hopefully some of those things have been discussed before. And, and I'm going to have, you know, she wants to have two. You want to have 16. And then somewhere in the world, you come back to two. Okay, they always win. And um, I never wanted 16. Okay, I'll, let me assure you that. I thought four was bad enough. And um, so, you know, and so we talk about it. We plan about it. We time it. We work it out. And we go and get ourselves excited about what's going to happen when we have the baby and when we're going to have babies and what's it going to look like. And so we, as a church, I'm planting a seed that we need to start dreaming. What are we going to do? Do we want to sit in this place for, the, for another 50 years just doing what we're always done? Or do we want to plan? Do we want to have babies? Do we want to think beyond generation, generations and generations? Do we want to have, be expectant? In 18 months, 
This will be 50 years old. It needs babies. So we're going to dream and plan. Barren too long, babies now. So we start to dream about planning, talking. And in 2022, that's what we will do. We're going to dream again. We're going to talk about what God can do again. And get excited and a passion about God giving new birth. Not just, and I'm going to say not just in the church, but in every department of the church and in each of your own lives. Talk it. Dream it. Don't talk the COVID and, and all the things that have gone wrong. Talk about what is about to open up in your life. Dream again. And maybe 2023, maybe, I'm not promising, is a year to have a baby further. Maybe it's even north. Maybe it's even east. But God's the father. But we're going to dream. We're going to expect. We're going to talk it up. We're going to build for it. We're going to plan for it. So that's one part of it. But what about an outreach? This year, we're already planning the second term. We're actually jumping ahead, but Norma's coming on board looking after outreach and a whole stack of things. So Norma's going to be, uh, look, has already started planning and got a plan for uh, English classes in our church. So we're going to look at that in the second term out there. We've got, um, uh, we've got uh, breakfast. Uh, it's not a breakfast, a breakfast club. It's still going. Uh, that's even a praise note for uh, how that is still going. Uh, but we're also going to have, uh, Helen is going to do a, um, is heading up a, um, a after school kids club that's going to be happening in this place in the new year. So the, the land that we live on is starting to spread. And hopefully, hopefully we get to overseas to see what we can do in Thailand and in Cambodia. But definitely August again, there's going to be another trip to the Kimberleys. And I spoke to a pastor of another church because one of their guys had called me about it. And he wants to, it was a quick call because he was visiting someone in the hospital, but he's ready to join us. So it'll be a cho two churches combining together to go to the Kimberleys and do some building and some ministry in, the, in, in, in August. And we'll keep you up to date there. But there's also opportunities to support the homeless, the at risk, the vulnerable as uh, we're going through. And you know what? Online church needs to come. The world, the way the world is going, needs to come. And so we'll be, we're going to be doing that. But you, we need people. When you do an online church, you don't think it just plays and goes through. It takes technical people. It takes someone to monitor what goes on. And so stuff, that's where resources are needed. Even I was reading something the other day. There's VR church. Anybody ever heard of VR church? It's real. It's virtually real. Virtual reality church. So there's a whole, you know what? I'm not saying we're going now. I'm just, I'm planning See, when you're barren, you don't even think, you think, you just, you shut everybody else off. They're, they've got babies, I don't want to have anything to do with them. But there are, there's a whole community of people that are so fearful and so caught up in anxiety, they're locked in their houses, playing online in a virtual world. But people are going into that, that world and creating congregations in the meta-universe and leading people to Jesus so that they may get healed and then come into the real church. Now that is telling me, that is not barren thinking. That is crazy thinking. Whoever thought of that is brilliant. Now I'm saying we're not there yet. I mean, if some of you guys, if I'd sent you into the meta world, I'd never get you back out of it. <clears throat> but I'm just talking, what happens when you're no longer barren? You go beyond Star Trek to places no one has ever gone before. And guess what? Each and every one of you, each and every one of you is not required. You might not have children. You might be a grandparent. You might not have had children. But you can still be a person of influence and a person of expectation. Then it says, and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. And this is where we talk about the dwellings. So in that case, the tents are flexible. So as a church, we need to be adaptable and fluid. And so our main focus in being adaptable and fluid, and that means it continues on, but right now what we're focusing on, need to refocus on as a primary area in our church of our Sundays services is our life groups now and our small groups have to become a major attention of our church. And, when, and to do that, We've actually put Pastor Dan in charge of life groups under care, a part of the pastoral care ministry of Tracy. And he's already come up with a new name, which the leaders know. And they are no longer called life groups. They are called encounter groups, or for short, because that's who we are as Aussies, e-groups. Okay, I want everybody to say e-groups. I didn't hear you. Say it again, e-groups. All right. 
Now, he's, and you say, well, how's Pastor Dan going to do that? Well, he's just a big man. He can, can, he can handle a lot. And, no, and also because he's raised up a great leadership team. You, you notice Pastor Dan's not on stage as often as anymore because the band is increasing and lead, leadership is ta- has taken place there. And so that's how that is unfolding. Already, now this changes every day, but at the last count, there were three new groups about to start this year. Okay, three new groups in the first week I gave him the responsibility. That's where he got the job. And so we actually have a slide of all your e-groups, okay? Somewhere up there, there should be pictures. Of, there you go. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. So there, so Kalaroo is a new one. Kalaroo, that sounds like a, that's Tiana making all that noise, Blake and Tiana. Uh, Marangaroo. Fight us. That was too quiet. A young adult group. Um, and where's the other one? Who's the third? Oh, Balga, Carson and Norma. Now that's a big group. And all the other regulars that have been faithful and out the people. So this is where church life is done. If you're not part of that, then you aren't part of being discipled. You aren't called to attend a church. You're actually called to be part of something. And we'll talk about that in a few more minutes. And so they're starting up and they're visible. And let me just tell you, at the back there is, there'll be some places where you can ask questions later on about some of these things that we're talking about. And so they're crea- being created and started last week. The new ones will be starting uh, in a fortnight's time. They run every two weeks. This week is prayer meeting. And, um, but also some, there's going to be work in our physical building. We actually have had a promise of a sizable amount of money from somebody. Uh, still haven't got it yet. But uh, to plan for, to fix up our, um, uh, our cafe, to get some insulation, AC in it. And we'll tidy up the rest of the building. Meanwhile, at the same time, with the growth that we're doing, we've got someone working on how do we redesign this building for the next stage of growth. So we're constantly thinking about extending the tent so the tent can embrace the next generation. And that's a medium, that part is a medium to long term. But the other thing that we need if we're going to extend the tent is resources. And I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about people. The tent, guess what? Have you ever thought about this? The tent, oh, let me put it this way. I've got a gazebo that sits in my backyard to extend our patio with the grandkids around. I didn't one day go, God, Oh, God, I want that gazebo to extend. And bang, I twiggled my nose or I, whatever it did. And suddenly a gazebo suddenly popped into my backyard and my kids can play under it. No, I had to buy one. I went out there and my son and I pulled it apart, put it up, and my kids can play under it. And for some reason, we Christians get so super spiro, we think that God plans the church and then he goes, wiggles his tips and things happen. And it doesn't happen. The tent isn't spread by itself. It takes physical people doing physical things. Everyone doing their part to give back and not just take. We love the chips in this church and the coffee. But who's cooking them? All right? Who's eating them? I can look at some of you and know who's eating them. (laughs) But who's cooking them? You want to keep them? Get up and cook. We love the worship. But who steps up and use their gift and goes to practice every Tuesday night and practice at home? We're grateful for the words appearing up on the screens for the rest of you too lazy to bring their Bibles or filming it for online. And we're so grateful. I'm glad somebody else does that. But what are we doing? It takes people. We love our kids getting out of here, going up there, being blessed, cared and taught. But guess what? somebody's doing it. What about you? We love things that happen to make this place neat and tidy on a Sunday. So we just turn up, sit out, worship. Yeah, good work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But somebody is working this building for for an hour or or more before you get here. They're called encounter teams, and they're desperate for you to help. See, God doesn't do those things. Did you not? Have you realized that? God didn't do those. God didn't do it. I'm not being sacrilegious. I'm not being disrespectful. God didn't do any of that. He didn't make these musicians play or these musical instruments play. People did. Anointed by God, obedient to God, serving God, expecting from God and doing great things for God. Because God is revealed through His people. 
doing it. And so at the back, we have a couple of tables set up, and they're going to be leaders at the end of the service, where you can actually go and inquire, what can I do? Rather than taking, now what can I put back into the body so the body can be all that it's called to be? And they will explain, they'll give you some lists, and, and you can be part of that. And so quickly moving on, the next thing that the, the, the sparrow woman was told, I don't want you, when you're building it and when you're extending the land, I don't want you to spare. Don't hold back, it means. That j- trust God and be expectant. Step up, remove excuses with a big yes. You know, when you talk about uh, the, our, our friend in India, and when you talk about uh, William Carey, he, had, he could have had all the excuses. I lost a child. I lost a building. I lost a wife. He never made an excuse. He just lived with expectation and kept moving forward. Do not spare. Invest in the new baby is what we want to do. Investing in the family. See, be f- f- faith people in our time, our skills, our attitude, and our finances. You know, we've put Steph on for another day a week. So two days a week, Steph has come on on our church. She's going to do youth, and she's going to do outreach. Already they love her in the schools. We've put Helen, who runs our children's department, this year because so she's come on as an intern doing Bible college and serving in the church a couple of days a week. And we expect in that children's ministry not to be a t- caretaking, it to be a place where children will learn to prophesy. They don't have to wait to get around you boring lot. They They're going to prophesy up there. Then come in here and teach you how to do it. They're going to be anointed. New leaders will grow up there and then come in here and take over. I'll lose my job. It'll be awesome. I'll sit back when my dad is sitting alongside him and go, they're doing it. I don't have to go. That's another 20 years time, right? Norma, we've already talked about it. It's taken on some, I was taking outreach and, and cafe. Uh, we've talked about Dan stepping up in a whole different role uh, out of his comfort zone. But what about each of us? Don't hold back. Think bigger about your life and about the next generation. Okay, quickly moving on. The next point is lengthen your cords. And this is a really quick one. Our strong, what is he talking about? Our strong, godly relationships, connections, and network. What holds the tent up? What is it, how does it stay there? The extent and number of the cords determines the stability of the tent. So the question personally, even as a church, who are we connecting with is important. Who do we have coming in and speaking into the church? Do they match? Will they hold the church up? Will they support the church? Will they build the church? Will they feed the church? What does the structure look like in the church as we move forward? Constantly changing so that the church can continue to grow and enable the mission. And then this last one, and strengthen your stakes. These are the holding points. You know what stakes are? Not the things you eat. You know that? It was the stakes that go in the ground. And so make sure they're in solid ground. The holding points of this church, Jesus is the center and the source of everything. Not me, not you. Jesus is the center. Upon Jesus said, uh, this revelation Peter had that Jesus is the son of the almighty God, God on earth. He said, upon that revelation, I will build my church. Not upon the revelation of a man, but upon a revelation that he got from God, I'll build my church. We are a word-based church. We are a Holy Spirit church, in a focused church. He is God on earth. I don't know if you realize, Jesus went back to heaven, and guess who he sent? Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit came down, and he inhabits us, and he empowers his church. That's who we are. Time with Him, guess what, makes us expectant of God dreams and visions. If you don't have any God dreams and visions, I guarantee you there's a link between the lack of Word and the lack of time with the Holy Spirit. He impregnates us with the Word. We have strong good governance in our church, and uh, I hope to I'll introduce you to the board at another date because we want to add to that soon, but we want to eventually add eldership into the life of the church under that. But we also strengthen leadership through opportunity, accountability, and training. It's not just, oh, you can go there and do it, but opportunity, accountability, and training. And these, those leaders will come from those who love God, love the church, and are already involved. There's one other area in this, under this that I wanted to highlight, which most of us know about now, is that we stepped out this year to start Alpha Crucius Campus here, I think that's what they call it, on our site, to train leaders. It's a diploma in leadership. It's actually coming out of Alpha Crucius, who this week got announced as a, univer- a college, university college. They went up another level in the tertiary scheme of things, uh, recognized before the government after all the hoops and balances they had to do and all the other stuff they had to jump through. And they are now a Christian Pentecostal, the first Christian Pentecostal university college in our nation. 
That's pretty cool. So we're running a one course at the moment on a third Tuesday night, and we're going to meet after the prayer meeting on Thursday. Those interested, and you can join us. Uh, that'll be around eight-ish on Wednesday. But that is to train up leaders, a new standard for building bigger leaders for the future. Alva Crucius has, has already become this university this week. So we want to build that so that we can do something great for God. And we're going to stick to our vision. We're going to stick to the values and the mission, which is part of what we do in that stake. The other thing that we do is we disciple people. We don't have attenders. People go for a stage of attending, but that's not your goal. I mean, I, the worst time in my life was when I stopped being able to play sport and became a spectator. Not the worst time. I mean, I mean it's been a lot worse than that. But I remember the transition. I even remember trying to get back when I was coaching and man, managing a footy club in, in Bansdale. I'm trying to get my, and my son was playing. I said, come on, let's play reserves together. I just want one more game. You and I can do it together. He goes, Dad, you play, I don't. That's terrible, isn't it? Because he knows I'd end up with a broken neck or something like that, something stupid. Or I'll get in a fight or something will go wrong and, and um, embarrass him. But it's something, I, I hate being a spectator. You know, some of us have FOMO, fear of missing out. A lot of us have, you know, and I don't, yes, Diana, okay. And it's horrible to be a spectator. And so we want to create disciples, not attenders. Making a decision to follow Jesus is a moment in your life. Being a disciple is a lifestyle of following Christ. See, being in church doesn't make you a follower of Christ any more than a skateboard parked out there in the car park becomes a car. Following Christ is not just adapting, adopting certain beliefs it's also adopting certain actions and practices. So growth track is what we do to help what the church is responsible. You have your own responsibility, but the church is responsible to help make disciples. We have jo, jo, uh, gro, uh, what we call our growth track. And so the first step here is you get encounter God. That's when you get born again and we do foundations, courses, but you make that decision whether in church or out of church. And then we have Encounter Your Church. So this afternoon at 3.30, for well, anybody new in the church, uh, we would love you to come along there and hear what I've got to say. A lot of it, some of this stuff that I'm sharing and a bit more about governance. And that goes for about an hour. That's today at 3.30. Uh, encounter Your Church. Um, and then as part of that, you go home and you get material to embrace your purpose where you discover your gifts, your callings and your, and your personalities and you can then find where you fit. And that's done at home after today. And then next Sunday at 3.30, uh, we go and establish your safe church. We take you through our protocols and our procedures on making sure this church is safe for the vulnerable by law, by best practices, and by the Word of God. And it's something we're very serious on it. So all our, most of our volunteers have working with children uh, stuff and all that and must go through that step. And then the last step, which is done at your own level, is encounter groups and in, in, interest groups, particularly in count, e, e groups. And that's where, and they can start any time, but that's where you're actually encouraging each other. You're getting activated in ministry. So that's our growth track. where It's our responsibility to help you grow. But you have your own responsibility by stepping up and stepping out into it, being expectant. And so we... So why do we do all of this? I think the last verse said it when we said it at the very beginning. The last verse of what we read was found in Isaiah 54 verse 3. For you soon will be bursting at the seams. Your descendants will occupy other nations and resettle the ruined cities. In other means, I love that. Your descendants, barren woman, your descendants? <laughs> your descendants? Excuse me, I'm barren. I can't have descendants. In God, all things are possible. Of course you can. Of course you can. Of course you can. You know, on Sunday, on Friday, I went to my brother's mother-in-law. So Andrea and Mark were here. Andrea's mum passed away just before they left, and their funeral was on Friday. And they read out her whole life. Her two kids were adopted. So Andrea and Suzanne are adopted into that family. But then looking at the descendants that have been produced, the influence that has been produced, even though she was a barren woman. What she did in her life as a midwife, working with Dr. George O'Neill and his now Trixone program for 10 or 15 years, in the, at the age of 61, right to the very end, serving, making a difference. She was never barren. She was never barren. She produced a destiny. 
For you soon will be bursting at the seams. Your descendants will occupy other nations and resettle the ruined cities. Tonight we're going to pray for barrenness and letting go. I really believe for a breaking of curses, disappointments. and I want to talk a little bit about Ishmael. Even Ishmael's were blessed by God. And you'll find out about that tonight. And pray for the restoring of joy, dreams, vision, and fruitfulness. But first this morning, are we expecting? And while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I don't know everybody here. I don't think that I can see everybody. And we're fitted coming to a close. We've got one more, more thing. And that is I want to give everybody an opportunity to respond to what's going on in your heart right now. I'm particularly responding to Jesus. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have walked away from Him, grown cold with Him, or not sure because you were raised in a religious environment, Jesus is calling you today. The rest of us, we're confident in our salvation. But for you who aren't, this is your moment, your moment. Following Christ is a lifestyle, but your moment to be born again, forgiven of your sins, repent of your sins, receive His mercy, His love and His kindness, and the new creation be born inside of you is now, in this moment. And so I'm asking you, if that is you today, that you will say yes to Jesus. This is not yes to vision. This is not yes to this church. This is yes to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This is between you and Him and also between me because I want to be able to pray for you. But the decision is between you and Him right now. We will help you afterwards, but right now it's between you and Him. Do you, are you, will you choose this day to repent of the way you were going and to make Him your Lord and Savior and follow Him? If that is you, God is calling you right now. Lift your hand and we're going to pray with you. We're not going to hold you back. We're just going to pray with you. Anybody in this room knows they're not right with God, but this is your moment to get right with God. Then lift your hand right now, and we're going to pray with you. Father, thank you for every single person in this place today. Father, I'm trusting that everybody here knows you. But if they don't, Lord, I pray this will be in a moment of encounter with you, that even in their heart they will choose to follow you. And they'll come and see us afterwards. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Can I just do one last thing and then we're going to close the service. It's a big day, but this is our setting of vision for the year, so we take a little bit more time. But I wanted our new e-group leaders uh, to come down the front and stand at the front. Oh, they're all of them, sorry. Well, they're all new e-group leaders because we didn't have e-groups before. We had life groups. Now we've got e-groups. So e-group leaders, come and stand at the front. And don't be hesitant to stand at the front. How are you going to stand in your life group if you can't stand at the front? And I'd like our, I would like also our department leaders to come out as well. And I would just want to introduce you, key leaders, uh, caring and leading the church. Uh, next month, I'm hoping to, I'll introduce you to our board and maybe some others. Uh, but to, for the sake of time and tonight, this morning, I just want to introduce you to these groups. And um, <clears throat> so can we also put the slide? Oh, they're on the slide. And we can play a game if you want. Can you match the slide to the people on the front? Okay. <laughs> And if we mingle them all up, it could be a shuffle game, okay? And, um, but these are, okay, so these are our life group leaders all the way down. This is, Helen is our, Helen's in charge of our children's department. And uh, uh, then we have, where have we got down there? These are life groups, life groups. Uh, he's on the board as well. And life groups, oh, our outreach and youth school worker, high school worker, Stephanie, all right? And Dan's, uh, uh, what are you doing? Um, uh, the Dan, the man, okay? Whatever we say. Okay, he's um, in charge of all of these guys. Okay, uh, what are you doing? Oh, Fidus is our young adult, one of the young adult new leaders. These guys have got um, a, a group now in Kalaroo. I just like Kalaroo, Kangaroo. That's a cool name. Um, you guys are on Tuesday. What night are you guys doing? Not home. So they're hoping to do Thursday. So we're going to have Tuesdays, Thursdays, and the rest of Wednesdays. So we're open to all kinds of dates and weird and wonderful places. And these guys are in Balga. And Neil's over, and Neil and his wife, who's up and children, they're in um, Girawain. And you're here at the moment, but temporary, is that right? And another young adult, uh, Trevor's another young adult leader, plus our sound and everything else. You know, most of these people are actually doing multiple tasks. 
If I look around, most of them are doing multiple tasks. Some of these, they're going to rush off and do coffee. They're going to rush off and do children next week, or they're going to rush back to the sound desk. And so you have an opportunity to take the load off them or to extend what we can do by you getting on board. And so at the end of the service, we have some tables set up there. And some of these guys are going to be manning them. That You can go and talk to them about what you, how you can be involved, where you want to go on a mission trip, you want to help children, you want to help the encounter team set up. That's the easiest job in the church. You only have to take, stand there and take an offering up or wander around the building and make sure it's clean and tidy. How hard is that? We even give you a spray can to kill all the spiders. If you like killing things, you have a job in our church. We cover everything that's inside. No, no, that doesn't sound right, does it? But I'm just saying you can. You think that's hard? No, it's not. And you don't even, I, I, I tell you what I'm really aware of right now as well. Some of you will have some immediate no's. But why don't you just ask in case there's a yes for you? Now, it's an opportunity for you. It might not be big, but it's something you can contribute. I'm thinking about some of you that have come from other nations that English is not your first language. And I know that becomes a barrier. I've traveled to other nations and know that my English is a barrier to them. But you never know. Expect great things from God. Do great things for God. And you never know. There could even be a group in your language that we need to start. An e-group, and why not? Let's be creative. You might be our VR church leader. I'm not sure that's ever going to happen, but you know, you never know. But you know what I'm saying? Don't say no. Don't say but. Sing again, barren woman, for you're going to expand and your descendants are going to come. The generation that you came from, that curse will be broken. We're going to pray over that stuff tonight. And you're going to be free to produce healthy, generations and so let's just reach out our hands for these of our leaders right now father we thank you for each and every one of them we thank you lord that you have called them that you called all of us and father they've stepped up they're expectant and they're doing great things for you we pray lord you'll lead them and guide them you'll protect them you'll cover them you will empower them the anointing to empower and authority be upon them in the name of jesus now, Lord, out of this will grow fruit, many disciples, and many descendants. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. 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 Thank you. Tonight at 3.30, I'll be doing growth track, and then I've got another message for tonight, if I have a voice left by then. But growth track is something where we just impart a bit more of this and you know more about the church, sign up to do what you can do. And uh, love you to be there if you haven't done that and become part of things. Be blessed. Why don't we all stand? You know, Tracy just reminded me that you, you could open your home. You might not be confident at leading a group, but you can open your home to a group. And you will be blessed. You will be blessed. Yeah, because your wife or husband or someone will clean your house every week for you or every fortnight. Your house will suddenly be clean. Unless you have grandchildren living with you. But you know what? It's a privilege to serve and lead Encounter City Church. Thank you for most of you still liking me and us. Everybody likes Tracy. But it's an honor. And so I pray the blessing of God may his face shine upon you, may his hand be upon you, may his presence walk with you and around you and cover your back and your front and be camped all around you, that you will be known as his kids, his children. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.